Live from Vancouver, Canada, it's theCUBE at OpenStack Summit Vancouver 2015. Brought to you by headline sponsors EMC and jointly by Red Hat and Cisco. With additional sponsorship by Brocade and HP. And now your hosts, John Furrier and Stu Miniman. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live day three at the OpenStack Summit in Vancouver, British Columbia. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Lamb Jones, Stu Miniman, Chief Analyst on the Cloud and Infrastructure at Wikibon.com. And our next guest, Mark Interante, who's the SVP of Engineering at HP Cloud Group. Welcome back to theCUBE. CUBE alumni, great to see you. Thanks, great to be back. Um, we love always having your talks on theCUBE here. Also, you're talking to everyone. There's a lot of engineering involved this mm -hmm. year, more than ever. I mean, this is the theme this year is engineers are here, yes. building not just kicking the tires, no. sessions are packed, people are sitting on the floors with their laptops open, so it's a pretty amazing environment. So what's up, what's up with the code? Where's all the action? What have you guys shipped? Uh, Give us some of the data. Share uh, what's going on in HP uh, Cloud. So uh, the Keyler release is really, uh, let me start with the, with the OpenStack community itself. And the, the Keyler release I think is, is, is fascinating. A Couple of really big things landed that matter to customers. Uh, so one, federating Keystone. So what that means is you have multiple clouds, you connect them together. You saw the uh, demo that we, uh, Blue Box, um, and uh, a digital film tree did. So showing a complex multi-cloud, private and public cloud federation working seamlessly. That's great, because that, that's really enabling multi-clouds happening. You know, another thing I'm excited about is in Swift, we finally w cracked the nut and really got into production something called erasure coding. And you're like, what's that? Yeah. Erasure coding allows you to more efficiently store at the same reliability level, large scales of data. And so, classic Swift, three copies for the kind of redundancy you need, erasure coding about 1.6. We just cut the price in half. And that's like, it's awesome to have software cutting the price, yeah. cutting the price of hardware. Yeah, 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 Mark. I mean, we at Wikibon we've talked a lot about okay. you know killing RAID. Yes, <laughs> yes. And uh, you know, therefore, object storage. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where erasure coding's there. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That's how the cloud should be. Mm -hmm. um, wait, the future's here now. It's just yes. uh, unevenly you know distributed. Uh, Absolutely. Distributed. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it totally is. So I think th those are those are just uh, kind of two of the things that I'm most excited about when I talk to customers. A lot of people are really interested in, in scale out storage, uh, and then they're they're trying to figure out how do they connect their multiple clouds. People have multiple private clouds, whether it'll be a, a production cloud, a dev tech cloud, or a, a business line cloud, they still want to connect them together, because they want to be able to move some stuff back and forth, and this allows that. And you know, we were talking with the Cisco guys earlier in this whole internetworking phase that TCP IP enabled back in the you know, computer industry. Mm -hmm. Cloud is inter-clouding, not internetworking, but like the inter-cloud relationships are very interesting, is that you're seeing people wanting not one cloud, mm -hmm. they want the ability to work, and you guys talk about bursting. Yes. Explain that dynamic from a technical perspective, that from a client perspective, you look at a pool of resources mm -hmm. out there where the storage and whatnot, and a set of services, yeah. service architecture, whatever you want to call it, and the cloud opportunity. It's not just one cloud. And you guys have that philosophy, explain that. Sure, well I think if you, if you look at a, a cloud as a set of resources that are tied to the actual underlying infrastructure, people are going to be building differently abled clouds with different capabilities, and they're going to be in different time zones, different geographies. You can't get away from capacity, throughput, latency, and, and geographic, the geographic nature of this. So w people are going to want to have uh, this is why people are building certain clouds in Manhattan, because they want speed of light to the stock exchange. They want different kinds of computes in those areas. They put them in, the, in Chicago in different areas. So we see, and we want to enable people to build a wide class of them to fit their needs and make the most efficient use of compute and storage resources. So customers don't talk about infrastructure as a service, or platform as a service, or software as a service. No, it's not their don't. language. That's the industry language. Yeah. Right? Those are like the layers people like to put boxes in. They talk in, what is, what is the language of the customer? As oh, an sure. From an engineering yeah. perspective, you have to map, I mean, we talked about services architecture yes. earlier. But they don't say, I want to pass, or I want no. some cloud foundry. Well, I want, they do it for a reason, because they're architecting. What's your view of the current language sure. or conversation that customers want to no. have? What's some of the linguistics, I, you so know? I, great question, so I was, in your, I was in Europe for a couple of weeks just here in the last month, and here's what customers are talking to me about. And typically these are kind of VPs of infrastructure, these might be CIOs, these could be VPs of application development. And the conversation's absolutely sorted around, I want to build an environment 
for my application development teams to move faster with less friction so they can innovate more. And so how do we build that environment that allows application developers to have a good, productive, happy life in developing? And that's what the CEOs are asking them to do, that's what the CIOs are taking that charter down, and the infrastructure guys are there to enable that, those application developers to help software take over the world. And if you don't have this a good environment, what happens? Turnover goes up, productivity goes down. And the conversations are all about automation, DevOps, CICD, mm -hmm. and the, the talent transformation. How do you make use of this underlying technology? So, so it's very little about uh, kind of actually, I as is the enabler for mm -hmm. developer services, yep. and that's what developers care about. So I got to ask you the philosophical question. Sure. Cloud flips things upside down, and, and, and we've heard a lot of those conversations on theCUBE where it's upside down, you know, things are think people are thinking differently. What's upside down that's an opportunity? What has the cloud done in a, from a shifting a mindset? How does it change? Yeah. What in your, what's flipped upside down? Where's the action? How can someone take advantage of and move quickly and be agile and go from old way to new way? Sure. Um, so I, I, think, I think the thing that has flipped is, is very straightforward. It's flipped us from a land of scarcity to a land of seemingly infinite abundance. So when you have seemingly infinite, you do things with those resources that you would have never done, because it would have been silly to waste 100,000 transistors to make a digital watch. Whereas today, there's like a bi billions of transistors all around me. So w the cloud enables seemingly infinite storage, seemingly infinitely configurable networks, and of course, seemingly infinite slice-upable compute which means that I, as a developer, can, spit, can get things almost instantly and then manipulate them. So that opportunity is what's making application developers. Yeah. And Stu and I were talking earlier about this notion of like things are being invented for the first time, because if you take that, yeah. if you believe what you just said, which we do, there are an infinite amount of, well, in, infinitely. Seemingly infinite. Yeah, seemingly, seemingly infinite compute, storage, yeah. bandwidth, Internet of Things are on the horizon. People are connected to the network. It's distributed computing, et cetera, et cetera. New things are being invented mm -hmm. because you couldn't do that before. That's right, yes. What are some examples in your mind that you could share where you see this happening, some proof points where you say, man, this was never possible years ago. This is what's happening. Here's how customers are thinking about uh, the value chains of IT and whatnot. Uh, so uh, maybe just maybe in the, if you pick the, um, the airline industry and the, and the airline manufacturing industry, the amount of data and the amount of understanding about the dynamics of a single airplane. So a single airplane generates about one terabyte per flight. And that's what that's kind of with kind of current level sensors. I bet you in 10 years or five, year, five years, it'll be five times that amount. If not more. If right? not more, if not more. And so what that allows people to do is understand wear and tear, reliability, uh, performance characteristics, another three or 5% uh, improvement in the next year or two on operational efficiency and help reduce global warming and all of these things and enable a data-centric enterprise for manufacturing. And we just have not had that. What we had was, I think the gear on my plane needs to be about this big. And an engineer drew the gear in a CAD system and they've got their gear and they put it in the plane and they never change it for 30 years. Today they take the gear, they take them out, they do uh, image processing against it, they look at the wear characteristics, they go, if we, we can make this thing 50% lighter by doing a different alloy on this edge, then all of a sudden they take 10 pounds out of the plane. You do that times 100 or a couple of hundred, and yeah. you end up with a radically different process. Yeah. Fuel so savings. Yeah. So, 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 so Mark, um, if I look at things from a system design, mm -hmm. I, I love what you're saying about kind of infinite this, infinite that, yeah. but there's no such thing as removing a bottleneck from the system. That's correct. It's yes. only moving it somewhere else. Yes. So, is it the people that is, you know, the bottleneck in the system now? When I think, you know, you, yeah. you're SVP of engineering. Yes. So, you know, how do you get the right people? When I talk to the customers, when I talk to the startups, mm -hmm. talk to everyone, it's, there's not enough well-trained people. And we, we, you know, we spent years talking about, oh, there's going to be a shortage of data scientists, mm -hmm. you know, there's a shortage of this and that, you know, is there a shortage of people or, you I, know, what, you know what, what's the big challenge? Well, I, th I, think, I think there's absolutely a shortage of, of, of good engineers in, in that want to that wanna work on your problem. Yeah. Again, there's lots of problems. The good news is we're expanding rapidly. So this person wants to work on that problem, it's not yours. They want to work on somebody else's problem. So I think we've got a shortage there. I, I believe that we got to start early in the pipeline in high school and we need to show people how powerful STEM jobs are, 
how they're not that, they're not nerdly, they're actually quite fun, and we got people here having a lot of fun, we got a lot of people designing things, problem solving. I really want to address the, the critical shortage of women in, in our community, it is a, it is a big deal. Uh, I think that that is an area where we have to work on the pipeline, so we're getting people earlier who want to go into these fields. Um, I think that's a huge challenge right now. Talk about Cloud Foundry. Mm -hmm. You guys are a big part of that. HP's differentiating with your unique view of your customer base. Mm -hmm. We heard uh, Bobby Patrick on talking mm -hmm. about bursting and that it's not about public cloud and clarified that mm -hmm. you're in the public cloud, mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not going to get out of the public cloud capabilities, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily a business in the sense of that misquote that, was, that, that yeah. the New York Times quoted uh, Bill Hilf on. Um, it's all going to work together. So it's, it, he explained it works together. Yep. Right? Yes, so, yes. so Cloud Foundry is a big part of that. What yes. are some of the milestones that are, you guys are seeing from that effort? Um, what, and uh, how are you guys are differentiating against the foundation? Oh, that's, uh, so I think, so we've just had our, uh, our third big release of our Cloud Foundry system um, since November. And this was a big release because this has got native .NET support. Again, you know, 40% of enterprise developers are building in the .NET environment. And what they would like is, they'd like to be able to use more yeah. cloud and more passwords. from the cloud, yeah. Exactly, yeah. and so it's native, we've got support for the entire Microsoft tool chain, and IDEs embedded in there. Uh, the, the Foundry has actually accepted our code for incubation, which we're very happy about. We're, we contributed all that back. I did a keynote about 10 days ago and, and shared all that information. And I think part of it is for us is really becoming um, a more major player in the Cloud Foundry core like we are here in OpenStack. You guys are happy with what's going on there. Yeah, we're, we're absolutely happy. Uh, we've got great interactions uh, with, with the foundation and the other uh, leaders in that group. Um, and it's, a, it's getting a lot of good traction early, which is great yeah. to see. They're getting some ubiquity. They're getting a lot of great adoption from yes. the industry. It's not just one vendor. It's like a lot of great people. It is. But there, you, there's a lot of cooperation now involved. Sure. Which is okay. You, yes. HP's used to dealing with that. We do that all the time. What are you guys doing to differentiate on top? What is the unique HP twist? Because what's interesting sure. is that everyone's got their own unique twist. Yes. Right? So our, our, yeah. our twist is, is we believe that infrastructure matters and we're tuning and optimizing Cloud Foundry to work really, really well with OpenStack and we're unique in doing this. We've got um, a much tighter set of bindings and a much more broad set of capabilities that enable the Cloud Foundry user to be able to access and, and make good use of all the resources of OpenStack. But you're plugging in like .NET is interesting because yep. now you're tapping into a whole other development mm -hmm. community that has huge enterprise experience yes. that kind of needs a shot in the arm. I mean, I, I'm not going to, I mean, .NET, I'm not saying they're irrelevant, but like, no. it's a bit older, it you know, Web 1.0, 2.0, but now with cloud, Agile seems to be a competitive advantage. Yes. And yes. that's what developers are trying to figure out, where are the competitive advantages for them, mm -hmm. and who could they play with nicely in, in the stack, if you will. Absolutely, yeah. How do you attract them? When we, what, what's the conversation? Hey, guys, join us, and you know, like they rush and join you, or what was the dynamic? Because that's, well, uh, that's a tough nut to crack that developer community. Well, you know, I, 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 I don't spend a lot of time in our, kind of our developer evangelism side. So I'm not in as much of those conversations as maybe Bobby or some of other people are. So I probably don't have quite as many rich okay. experiences on that front. I'm trying to hire developers to help us build the cloud, and that's more of the conversations yeah. I have All right, so every let's week. Talk, let's talk about Helion, right? So yeah. HP Discover's coming up. So I know yeah. that you guys usually got a couple things, surprises. What, what can we expect at HP Discover coming up in a couple uh, of weeks? I can't quite tell you that stuff that we got coming up, but, it's, <laughs> but, but I, I hope, are you guys going to be we'll there? The Cube will be there. Oh, course. excellent. Yes, well, we do some we'll, have, we'll have a conversation then, because yeah. like, we've got some good announcements coming out. We've been working hard. We've so you will, you will have something? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yes. Okay. I, I guess, Mark, so let, let's bring it back to OpenStack then. Sure, yeah, you know, was, uh, we've made a lot of progress. Uh, you know, the, I think the integrated, the, going away from the integrated release, mm -hmm. going to the big tent, yes. uh, you know, talking about power by OpenStack, uh, mm -hmm. something we've talked a lot about a lot. Uh, one of the big gaps I saw is migrating from one version of OpenStack to the next. Yes. We need to get there. Yes. What else, what, what's the big challenge that we need to work on uh, to really kind of, I, I think we've got clean line of sight to maturity. Yes. Um, and we're almost there, but what do you think we need to do and how's HP helping so, uh, the community? So my big, uh, my big theme at my keynote last, uh, earlier this week is around reducing the operator complexity and operator load for running these things at whatever, you're, whatever scale you're at. So I want us to drive down the operator load by a factor of five in the next three releases. So we've been having conversations like three or four times a day in the last couple of days with, with other teams, with other people about how, what do you mean by that? 
How do we do it? Well, I've got all these tools. Well, we've got different tools. How do we find where the time goes in running a, pick a number, a 10,000 node cloud? And how do we take that time from this to this, you know, uh, by Barcelona? And part of that's just, it's starting to really understand where does, why is monitoring as complicated as this? How about playbook remediation for normal anomalies? Uh, we've done a lot of investments here in the last two releases on HA and the ability to, to lose part of a, a service and have it fail over. That's, that, that, that's already gotten better. And, H, and HP has put a lot of its expertise in HA into those areas. Yeah, you bring up a great point. I, I tell you, uh, especially the big enterprises have what I call hyperscale envy. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, yeah. if you, at Facebook at the Open Compute yeah. Summit said, you know, we manage you know, 20,000 servers per admin. Yes. Well the thing is, is really, they don't really have server admins, they have people that build applications, yes. and then they roll it out at you know, data center scale, not mm -hmm. even rack scale, yes. uh, and they manage it. Um, how does OpenStack you know, in, in HP Helion yeah. really move the needle to get us from you know, managing you know, you know, all the bits and pieces mm -hmm. of bespoke infrastructure to you know, what, what, what's the new metric? It's how do we say that we've got success and we're well, you know, doing a lot more? It's ad, it's, it's, I think it's ad, you know, admins per, per, per 10,000 nodes, yeah. and whether that you get that from from X to one fifth X is what I'm trying to drive to. And I'm also trying to get people to, to us to agree on a set of metrics, have, have teams go back and look, just share the stuff. In t and a, the community's pretty open. I mean, we've, we've shared a lot of things over time. Uh, we've, we've shared some of our size and latency of our, uh, our Cloud Files instance. Uh, and we had great feedback from the Swift community about the, our level of transparency uh, on some of the dynamics there. So I think part of it is let's share more actual data, figure out where the time is going, and show our development teams how they can make a big impact. You guys have been great contributors of OpenStack, and it doesn't, you guys don't get enough props because you know, the, the PR teams are all the mucky muck levels, but in the, on the ground here, <laughs> OpenStack, you guys dominate a lot of the yep. code. You guys, very, participation to hundreds of people here from mm -hmm. your team, um, HP Cloud, great community participating, been there from the founding, beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so give a little props there, and give Thank a little you. Give a shout out there. The team's doing great. You guys, are, you guys are doing great. You guys can share a lot of real code. So what's next for you guys? You're the engineer and that's where the action is. Yeah. You're under the hood, you're the chief mechanic of the cloud. Uh, what's the hot spots, where's the focus? You said you mentioned making the infrastructure matter, okay, I get that, but what specifically are you guys focused, lasered on in, in terms of engineering? Okay, so, well, actually, before I get to engineering, I think where I'm trying to put, encourage energy in the community is in learning operator knowledge and operator patterns and techniques, and on the other side of the fence, encouraging people to think a bit more like a product, some product management thinking. So I did props out to the, the product SIG, which is a cross uh, yeah. company group that's exploring, like how do we get clear on our personas? How do we get clear on the use cases? How do we help people uh, plan out a large cross-cutting set of features? Reference think, architectures, things of that Reference nature. architectures, yes. So if you think about cross-cutting set of features, it's really hard to do that in OpenStack. It takes many, many versions. What does that mean? So how would I do IPv6 end to end? How would I do better NFV support yeah, yeah. end to end? So the way to do that is to get really clear on all the 12 pieces that have to change, kind of product management. Yeah. Get yeah. really clear on, and it, make sure everybody understands that get six subsystems have to change in the next release. And get people starting to talk about them and have a higher chance of landing those in six months, whereas today it takes us 18. It's like feeding the community data and uh, discipline and practice that helps scale. Yes. This is a real opportunity for the community because mm -hmm. this is a scaling challenge, it's growing pains, right? I mean, it is. you know, we'll stack some say it's adolescence phase, it's on a path to maturity, but this is the you know, make this is the bones that need to be set in the skeleton of scale, right? You gotta yes. have some product management disciplines, yes. not just throw code over the transom. That's right. And I think part of it is, you know, um, it's been always been a very developer and technical led community. And what we're trying to find out is how do we have product managers enter the conversation? offer data, feedback, insights, uh, kudos and complaints from users in a way those can be yeah. consumed and problem solved. Yeah, the transparency is a closed loop, you got feedback from the community, customers all feeding in, so mm -hmm. you know, it can be a challenge, I can imagine. Yeah, all right, final word since we're cut on time, what's, okay. what's your goals next year, OpenStack? Uh, what are we going to be talking about? What do you see happening? And what successes do you see? What's, what's going to be the trans, the, the, the transformation of the next year? Oh, that's, a, that's a great question. So. Um, I want to totally land all of the dimensions of federation from the UI 
to the billing, to the authentication, to all those dimensions. So I think we've landed the first piece in this one. Mm -hmm. I think the next two releases, when we're in Austin next time, having some barbecue, I expect that we're going to be talking about a whole set of federated clouds that operate seamlessly, that are able to, I'm able to burst up resources, get them billed all back to me. That's probably the biggest thing. Um, and I want to see massive uh, upgrades to our operator capabilities and tools. I want people to say, look, we're, we're deeply on that road to getting the 5X, and people are not complaining or nervous about deploying an open stack because they feel like they know how to do it. Yeah, okay. just quick, quick uh, poke at that. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, cloud bursting is something we all kind of laughed about for yeah. many years. Um, I, I like a little bit more kind of sure. the you know, app catalog that we have. Yes. You know, why is Federated a little bit different? I know we're short oh, on time, I, I, but. Yes, I don't, I'm not a big believer in bursting. Yeah. Because what happens is people just, there's specialized cases where it happens. Yes. What people want, and what we've built uh, in the valley for the last 15 more or so more years is complex multi DC always up apps, and so I, I was I led Yahoo Finance for many years. So in doing that, Mything runs in five DCs. You lose a DC, you know, a page blips. You're all back up. So more and more people want those kind of apps, and they need those with data center resilience room resilience and service resilience. And that's much more of the hybrid sophisticated app that we're trying to enable easier to do. It was a real pain 15 years ago to do this. Yeah. A lot of PhDs just developing that code. Yeah, it's really that, that distributed world that we've been working towards. Yes, exactly. Awesome. Mark Interazzi, SVP of Engineering at HP Cloud, bringing his expertise and leadership to the community and sharing that, that's what's great about this community again. It's on the path of maturity. Congratulations, Royce. And again, props to HP for really a lot of great work you guys have done, being a big part of OpenStack, fostering innovation, for keeping the culture and passion and, and organic growth from the ground up, while bringing some mojo from the big company discipline in. So congratulations. This is theCUBE, we're bringing more data right after this short break. We'll be right back live. Day three coverage of the OpenStack Summit here in Vancouver, British Columbia. We'll be right back.